All right, okay. Again, hello everyone. I'm Nancy Wilborman. Like I said, I'm a PhD student here and I'm gonna be talking about trends in manure sample data. This is actually like a preparation for the Waste to Worth Conference coming up in near Toledo, Ohio, the end of April. So I'm glad for this opportunity to get me going so I'm not procrastinating putting this together. So it'll be good to get some feedback today too. So overview of what we're discussing today. Uh, this is really kind of some of the precursor of showing our preparations for our nationwide manure database creation that we're calling ManureDB. Uh, talk about working with several laboratories to acquire some re recent manure data. Uh, comparing this data to the Midwest Plan Service and American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers, ASABE look manure's nutrient values and identifying general nutrient trends and then ideas of what we'll have to know we have to work on to make our manure database manure db useful and user friendly as we go so why are we talking about manure today in the soil water and climate department uh, well it's an organic fertilizer containing uh, essential plant nutrients I'm going to apply it. It also can add more organic matter to the soil and microbiology, among other things. Uh, there's not super great estimates, but possibly a third of Minnesota cropland is fertilized with manure. One challenge is that it's a non homogenous product. So, unlike a commercial fertilizer where you know the exact NPK analysis that you're putting on, you know, depending on your source and liquid, solid, what species, what housing, what diet, it could really vary on what, what you are applying. But like commercial fertilizers, we do need to be aware of the environmental risk of losing uh, nitrogen or phosphorus into the environment and be um, cognizant of that. So a little bit more about our manure database project. Uh, we are currently working with the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute to help us create this database. Um, we actually have a preliminary database made, a uh, system to import data, and a very, very basic website so far. So we're getting our skeleton made. Uh, right now, we're waiting on some legal agreements to start working with more labs so we can get their data uploaded. As you can imagine, you know, there's legal implications. So I think actually just saw we got our agreement finalized and actually sent to a lab this week. So there's progress being made in that area. So what I keep talking about manure book values. What are these book values or standardized values even used for? Why is, why is this even important? Well, a few things, um, developing manure management plans. Um, before I started grad school, I actually worked for a swine business for 14 years in environmental services. And one of the things we did, if someone wanted to build a new barn, you obviously didn't have any manure samples because there wasn't any animals yet, but you needed, at least for regulations, you needed to show that you had enough land that you could spread the manure on. So we would look to these book values to see, okay, well, we just use those to calculate how many acres of land for these crop rotations do you need to have in your manure management plan. Um, it can also be used for designing manure storages, um, establishing best management practices for manure land application, and for modeling nutrient cycling and gas emissions for some other examples. Um, as mentioned previously, uh, a couple of the common sources for book values are manure characteristics put out by the Midwest Plan Service, and that was in 2004 published, and also manure production and characteristics standard put out by ASABE back in 2005. So as you can see, those are you know, coming on 20 years old. And I just pulled out just for an example of this. ASABE data for the swine numbers that you could see 
for a deep pit slurry, they had 24 samples from one set and another 268 for another from 1999 and 2000. So, I mean, this is over 20 years old. Some of these others don't even have dates on them. So you have to dig in a little deeper to see how, you know, how far back are these. For broiler litter, um, they had Missouri and Oklahoma samples, 95 of them. Layer hens, 48 samples. So those are just what they use for an average to put in these standards. So in our preliminary laboratory data, uh, we worked with five labs and we actually acquired over 127,000 samples uh, already. And this ranges from 2012 to 2021 um, in those timeframes, not exactly the whole period for all the labs, but they, they crossed that um, threshold. We sorted them into liquid and solid manure, and then divided them into four main livestock groups, beef, dairy, poultry, and swine. And it was a little challenging. Some of these standards did have more segmentation between like manure storage type or age of the animal or more detail than just poultry, like is it layer or turkey? You know, what, these were the little categories that we could um, divide them into. So that is one constraint we do have. Another thing is these book values and also all these laboratories have all their data come back in a variety of units. So one challenge is just getting them all um, standardized off the bat. So for solid manure, we translated that into pounds of nutrient per ton and pounds of nutrient per thousand gallons for the liquid manure. Uh, we calculated the medians uh, for total nitrogen, ammonium N, P2O5, and K2O uh, for each of those groups. And like I said, we didn't have any differentiation for housing, manure storage, age, or any, anything of that sort. All right, well, this is just saying this is the liquid um, comparison and what we could um, just kind of went from, is this, did the values seem to be trending higher from those book values or lower, or was there just no change or conflicting samples? So what, we, what I saw looking at the total nitrogen for the liquid samples, um, really couldn't see a, a big trend shift besides that seemed like the dairy manure was less in total and, and poultry was a little higher in ammonium and um, one that kind of seemed to cross the board was that the phosphorus P205 was trending lower in swine, dairy, and poultry. And again, I've been a lot more familiar with the swine manure of my previous work and you know, taking manure samples all over those years. I would say a lot of times our phosphorus level was half of what the book value was, mainly due to the diet inclusion of phytase that made it more um, able for the pig to use the phosphorus in their, in their diet and not excrete as much as waste. So that is one thing I mean, that I am more familiar with. Um, and the uh, potassium seemed to be a little more increased in the swine and poultry area. I just, just another quick side note, talking about like swine manure samples and how this can change. I mean, also, I mean, the newer equipment, the more well-maintained, less water wastage can make a difference on what you have for your samples. You could tell, did they change out their waters? And that could even make a difference. So that's just enough. And you could tell also who was well maintaining their facilities and not having leaks um, compared to those like for a new facility or someone that was a little more lax in that area. This is the solid manure chart. In this one, we found the swine, beef and poultry all seem to be trending higher. Uh, this could again be possibly to a water, you know, less water wastage, or it could, could be dietary changes. Um, phosphorus, this one did seem to be increasing for all these solid manures for swine, dairy, and beef. And it did seem like there is an overall positive trend in the potassium for all four, four types. So that was kind of interesting to see that trend. Uh, so what, what have we learned from doing this? I mean, a big lesson I think is standardizing these lab submission forms 
are going to be super important as we work to increase our number of labs that we're working with and the amount of data we bring in. Um, it's really hard to compare some of these. They're all just lumped together. Segmenting them out can make a big difference. And there just wasn't very much description we had beyond the species of animal on it. So we'll be really trying to work with our labs that we do and kind of give them our ideal template and see what they can. I mean, some have a very standardized way they output data, but to see how much they can to try to you know, make the data as useful as possible on our end. So like I said, our future plans, just trying to standardize these fields as much as we can, we're making an ide ideal template um, with all these different like litter type, is their agitation, species, bedding, storage type, and, and how they're analyzed, because there's multiple methods some of these things um, are, are analyzed by. Uh, also needing to figure out a unit conversion mechanism for data uploads. Um, we have a set, just a very simple one way. If you have it perfectly, the units we want, that's great. But we know that's not going to probably be the case. We don't really want to have a person have to do all these unit conversions by hand. So getting that uh, created will be a, a big deal. Uh, working to recruit more laboratories to, produce, to participate in our Manure DB project um, and just acquire more data sets. And then compare and analyze the data as we get access to it, you know, especially if we can get this more detailed data for the different species we're working with. And then trying to design MinerDB with statistical and data visualization features for future public use is our goal. So just to sum it all up, our MinerDB construction is underway. Um, we have looked at some preliminary data from five labs showing there have been changes in manure trends from previously published manure book values. Um, and we know detailed submission forms will be key for future robust comparisons. Uh, additional information, we actually do have a domain name that you can't probably visit yet in the public, but it's going to be manuredb.umn.edu eventually. Uh, my email or our lab websites are there, or you can see uh, Dr. Melissa Wilson or I on Twitter if, if you care to. Also, I'd like to give thanks, like I said, to Melissa Wilson and Aaron Cordes, my advisors. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Kevin Yanni. The BBE department, Larry Gunderson at Minnesota Department of Ag, uh, Tom Prather and Dr. Kevin Silverstein over at the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, let me know. Yes? That oh, 30% of Minnesota cropland is fertilized. That's everything else that you're not sure, right? Right, that's very, I was asking Melissa about this the other day. I don't know if you have any other comments, Melissa, if you're listening, but they're guessing 20 to 40, I think she said, or possibly. Well, I have two questions about that. One, yes. is there any effort to quantify that, like from the state or in any way to quantify it? Mm -hmm. And the second part of the question is, is uh, a lot of growers adopting variable rate technology now. And I, when I think of that, I always think of inorganic fertilizers. Mm -hmm. Are the trends in using variable rate technology the same for applicators, manure applicators? Are they excited about this? And is there a way to collect data from them about um, you know, the decisions they're making? Um, okay. Where, you know, what, yeah. what kind of fertilizer they're applying different types of land? Okay, I'll try to remember the first thing, but like quantifying, Minnesota would know for the larger farms that are, are regulated, you would have a fairly good idea about how much is getting produced, but the smaller farms aren't required to have, you know, any regulation. So that's a little more, you know, on the vega. And then also, are they populated with what quantity of animals? Does that fluctuate through the year than what they may be permitted for? So that can lead to a lot of, you know, possibility you know changes what the, what the cutoff is for that regulation like a big farm versus small what's regulated what's not you know like generally the threshold for what i'm a little more is. familiar and also you can step in here but i know in, in iowa in like a thousand animal units was a big cutoff in 500 you had to have animal units you had to have a manure plan 
and beyond. So, I don't know, Melissa, are you on there? Yeah, I'm on. Um, okay. <laughs> so there's the NPDES permits, which is the National Pollution Distrib the Illumination System, whatever it is. They are regulated and they usually have to report annually how much manure was applied. And those records um, can be publicly accessed, but they're not easily publicly accessed because they don't have a good system in place, uh, like a good electronic system in place at the moment where they're tracking that. So it's all paperwork. Uh, 300 animal units to 1,000. And for those of you who don't know, an animal unit is 1,000 pounds of animal. So basically, a uh, beef cow or horse are about 1,000 pounds. A dairy cow is 1.4 animal units or 1,400 pounds. But so from 300 to 1,000, they have certain reporting requirements, but I think they have to keep records. They don't necessarily have to actually send it to the state every year. And then below 300 animal units, is not always regulated, but they might be depending on the county rules or regulations or township rules or regulations. And if you pollute water, it doesn't necessarily exempt you no matter your size. Yes, yes, no one is allowed to pollute the waters of the state. <laughs> so, that is one of the rules. Yeah. And then regarding variable rate things, as far as what I dealt when I was in mineral management, a lot of it was more looking at your soil samples for your fields. I'm like, okay, well, if you have more fields than you are or if you had a super high P and K in a field, perhaps you would go to a different field, you know, to maximize the manure usage. But as far as like variable rate within a field, most people are going off of a nitrogen-based rate and you are more wanting a standardized amount across your field. So I haven't seen that. And then depending on what kind of applicator you have, a lot of these uh, mineral applicators can make nice maps and show like what the rate is across the field. And that can also be very interesting because they can kind of vary too, not on purpose, but just the nature, how it is. So, I don't know, do you have any other variable rate information, Melissa? Yeah, there's um, an application system from John Deere that's come out that allows for variable rate. And there was a lot of interest in it a few years ago. I've heard it's dropped off a little bit though, um, but as fertilizer prices have come up, maybe more people are looking at variable rate application. The problem is it's an expensive system to own because you have to have John Deere tractors to work with it, to work with rate adjustment and that sort of thing. So it's, there's a bit of a bit of a barrier to entry, so to say. I think a big deal is just having real good soil tests and knowing start there. And take manure, lots of manure tests too. I mean, you can have one, but I always told people the more you have, the better you can. Because even if you have one year, I mean, I said take them every year. You don't know if the diets are changing, how much water is being used. It could still vary in your pit depending on what part you know the pit is taken at, or is it after it's stirred real well? So I don't. Know. It's you know the more you have, the better decision you can make to try to get the maximum amount financially, and then also not for over applying for environmental reasons. Too. So. There's a question from Anna um, okay. in the chat. I'll read it, and uh, Anna, unless you would like to. Are you at all concerned that these improved book values will deter people from sampling and testing their own manure, or do you actually want them to test less? Oh, no, I'd still encourage testing more, definitely. Uh, for all those reasons, because diets could change, waters could change. How you maintain things could change. I mean, the more information you have, the better. But I think for all the reasons we say we use book values, like for people using modeling or doing planning, you know, having more current values, better information we have to put in, you know, the better information we have going out for other planning purposes. So I'd say for farmers, I definitely recommend continuing to sample, yes. Nancy, this is Satish Gupta again. I got a comment uh, for you and Melissa. Okay. One of the things that uh, we use was what's availability of nitrogen from the manure and the Midwest plan says 50% first year and 25 each. And I was wondering if you guys are thinking of uh, looking at the trends because the climate is changing both in temperature and precept if those values have changed very much over the last 20, 30 years? 
And it seems like each state has their own availability of what they recommend too. So I don't know, Melissa, you got any thoughts on that? Well, it just so happens to teach <laughs> we are just yeah. wrapping up a study to look at that. We looked at six different manure types and we definitely saw differences. We were in very two very wet years though. So we'll have that data coming out soon. Thank you. And isn't that for sec like second and third year availability, right, Melissa? Too? Checking. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We did that up to three years. Yeah, just because you apply it down and doesn't mean it's necessarily available for the crop to get. So that's another challenge with manure, for the commercial fertilizer. Well, feel free to ask us questions anytime otherwise, but thanks again for coming today and we appreciate it. And we said the next seminar is in two weeks, Kelly. So, all right. And we'll look forward to having more grad students in the fall. Do this, do this again. So, all right, well, thank you very much, everybody. So.